It is uh, 5 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the St. Croix County Board of Supervisors. We're going to start out with our invocation from Ted March. Marsh, I'm sorry, Ted. <laughs> yes. So I want to thank you all for having me here today. Um, I know I'm not from down south, but thank you all, right? Um, so I'm just going to say a prayer. It says invocation or silent moment. I'm, I'm not one to be silent, so let's, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for these people that have dedicated their time to this county board and, and making decisions. And Lord, I just ask that you guide them with moral convictions, help them to remember who they represent. And Father, I just ask in Jesus' name that you just watch over their families and and be with these people in Jesus' name. Amen. And please join me for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And it's time for roll call. We get to use our fancy electronic devices. Supervisor Adams. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, now we're ready for uh, public comment. And first I'd like to invite uh, Yvonne Larson up. Yvonne? Good evening, I'm Yvonne Larson, and my claim to fame is I am the first sworn court-appointed special advocate known as CASA here in St. Croix County. I am assigned by the court to a 15-year-old girl and I'd like to briefly share with you my relationship with her and how I see the CASA program benefit her. Kids that are in the CASA program come from backgrounds of abuse and nor neglect. CASAs are assigned when parents are not doing what is in the best interest of their child. My assigned child has experienced both abuse and neglect and has missed out on early parental guidance. As CASAs, we have access to investigative report and we attend court hearings. I meet with her in person every week at her foster home. Uh, we are working on goals. This summer she created two goals of getting all A's and making new friends at her new high school. I continually encourage her to do well in school and I am so proud of her. She made great grades and made new friends. One of my goals is to teach her about um, friendships, boundaries, boyfriends, and um, future plans for her. A social worker meets with her and her foster parents monthly. I have access to that social worker if needed. I have a great relationship with her foster parents, and I have established a direct line of communication with her school where I will be making visits. She has invited me to her school for pizza lunch and to meet with her favorite language arts teacher. I write a report for every visit which is submitted to our CASA director. Ultimately, those weekly reports are summarized into a court report that goes to Judge Needham, who has stated that our CASA reports are valuable because they contain information and comments from the child that he doesn't get from any other source. The court report includes my observations of her in several categories, her comments, and my recommendations to the court to promote her best interest. A dangerous situation has arised with her that requires intervention. CASA, the family, uh, foster family, the social worker are involved and we are working together on a solution for that. In summation, she and I have an open dialogue about what is best for her. And I hope that I am that person that's going to make a difference in her life. 
I believe the CASA program provides support and services now to her that will guide her as she navigates high school. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. <clears throat> um, other public comment? Anyone else from the public would like to address the board? Any other public comment? Don't be shy. Any public comment? Okay, we're gonna move on. Do we have a motion for the consent agenda? Supervisor Cook, second. Supervisor Osnes. I think we're ready to vote on that. I, I'm kind of guessing we yeah, I hit the wrong button. Hit the wrong button. Okay. We'll, we'll assume that those are all yeses and then consent agenda has been confirmed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're now ready for the um, county administrator's financial update. Yeah, get that out of your system now, Supervisor Adams. <laughs> Uh, the financial report is in the packet. It's through uh, September, so we're three quarters of the way through the year. I don't have anything specifically uh, to point out to you uh, other than uh, the budget continues to look good. The department heads are doing a good job of staying on track uh, for their budget, and we're right about where I would expect us to be at this point in the year. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, though. Any questions on the financial report? All right, seeing none, um, what I'd like to do now is to call to order the uh, public hearing regarding the proposed uh, 2024 St. Croix County budget. And we'll start out with a uh, short presentation from the county administrator. Uh, short, we didn't discuss that part. <laughs> Um, so it's the same PowerPoint presentation you saw before at the committee of the whole meeting, so I will go through it fairly quickly. Uh, so uh, the presentation, this is everything uh, that's in there. We'll go over the revenues and expenses. Uh, remember, this is a year-long process. Uh, if you were at the special uh, public protection meeting that we had uh, earlier today, we we're already starting to talk about the 2025 budget. Uh, so it's really you know, a year-long uh, process, though, of, of getting through this with a lot of input from a lot of different uh, stakeholders in this uh, to get to the final version that you'll see tonight. So our budget priorities, we'd met back uh, at the beginning part of the year and we'd come up with the 16 priorities. Uh, this budget uh, gets us through uh, really probably about 13 uh, with the four additional sheriff deputies that were added uh, from the Committee of the Whole. Uh, so we did a really good job of handling most of the priorities that the county board had laid out for the staff. Strategic goals, um, just to point those out that uh, they are out there, we do take those into consideration. A lot of the things that you'll see in the budget are addressing these specific strategic goals. The financial condition of the county, um, you know, to really highlight where we are. Uh, the equalized value continues to go up. You can see that housing uh, recession that we had, the market crash in housing uh, back in 2008. Um, but uh, we've been steadily going back up ever since then. And our net new construction uh, remains strong, you know, putting us uh, consistently in the top uh, five every year, uh, number three this past year. Population growth continues to grow. Uh, one of the very fastest growing counties in the entire state of Wisconsin. Um, and so it has pluses and minuses. It's great uh, to have all the new people coming, building new houses and contributing to the tax base. Uh, but every population increase has a corresponding service demand increase. Um, so it also taxes uh, the services that we're providing. Uh, debt, 
the debt is uh, sitting at about that ten and a half million dollar range. Um, so that's one of the things that we need to keep an eye on is the amount of debt that we have. Um, we are growing quickly and we have to account for that growth uh, by building the infrastructure for that. We've done a lot of investment though over the last decade. In 2016, we built the new uh, nursing home. Uh, in 2019, we built a new highway shop uh, and we're under construction now for the government center addition. Um, so we've done a lot of things uh, to position us in the long term for that, but you also see the, uh, the debt table in front of you uh, that we have to pay for that. Um, so the debt service has a part of the rate, uh, so you can see some blips up. Um, uh, what we like to see is those blips coming back down. Uh, so this is the debt as a percentage of the total uh, tax rate. Um, so we want to continue to see that going down. When it goes down, that means that that $10.5 million of debt is being shared by more taxpayers. Uh, so population increases, people are building houses and businesses, more people are paying for that debt. Um, so um, that's when you see the, uh, the dropping rate. All right, so what were the major changes from this budget? You know, really we had four major new revenue sources. Uh, we had our net new construction, which is it's the new growth, um, the new building in the county. So 2.9% gave us about a million dollars, 920,000. Um, shared revenues, there was a new state shared revenue package that was passed that gave us an extra $753,000. Sales tax uh, was up 1.1 million, uh, thanks to an amendment at the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, and then interest earnings was probably the fourth major large um, uh, revenue change. So interest rates are up, so we're realizing more interest earnings, uh, so we were able to capture about a half a million dollars there. So those are the four big revenue sources that came in. And then the expenditures going out, uh, new positions were $1.9 million of that money. Uh, so we turned around and invested a lot of the new revenues we had in expanding uh, services. Uh, we also were able to take care of our employees uh, with a step increase, a 1% COLA, and uh, kept the health insurance down to a 1% increase. And really everything else then was inflationary uh, type increases. Uh, your operating expenses, we're seeing inflation, whether it's, you know, uh, purchasing sand and salt mixture uh, to keep the parking lot clear, um, garbage service, anything that we have. Uh, and then the insurance program up by uh, quite a bit also. Um, I just got the auto insurance renewal rate for our collision and comprehensive and that was up 28% over the prior year. Um, so we're seeing inflationary pressures on a lot of our other expenses besides personnel. Uh, so the budget of revenues, again, this is just the same thing, uh, a little bit different format to show you where it compares to the prior year, but the four main revenue sources are listed here. Uh, where those revenues come in, um, come from different sources. Really about a third of it is property taxes, though. Property taxes is what gets the, the big billing all the time, but that's really only about a third of our total revenues. Uh, so we have other revenue sources. Uh, they just don't grow by very much either. A lot of them are our grants or charges for services. Uh, revenues are different depending on which department you're looking at. Um, so health and human services is a pretty even split between uh, state grants that they get, the charges for services and property taxes. Uh, highway is pretty close also, um, maybe a little bit more on the uh, charges for services as they provide service for the state and for uh, townships. If we look at uh, public safety, um, they're primarily all property tax. That's not a Pac-Man symbol, that's all property tax for public safety. Um, so they just don't have other revenue sources. So when you look at increasing in different areas, um, you usually have a different mixture of where those revenue sources need to come from in order to accommodate that. And a lot of our investment this year was in public safety, uh, which was heavily property tax supported, or really probably a lot of that shared new revenue went for that also. So the budgeted expenses, again, inflation, insurance, uh, new positions that we've added. Um, and then uh, library, um, I hadn't mentioned it before, I'll point it out now. Uh, so you see a large increase in the library. That's really just the change in format of the Hudson Library going from a joint library to a standalone library. Who's levying for the library? Support for that library has changed. So instead of the other three partners, 
the town of Hudson, town of St. Joe, and village of North Hudson, levying directly and giving it to the library. The county's now levying on their behalf and giving it to the library. So it looks like a big change, but it's, it's just a pass-through really for us. Expense distribution. Uh, so if you look at where all the different expenses are going, you can really see some of our big departments. Health and Human Services, Highway and Public Protection are the three big ones. They make up, you know, really the vast majority of what we do. Uh, and then expense by category. Um, where is it going? We're a service organization. So if you look at wages and benefits, uh, that's about 50% of the total budget. Um, so uh, what we do is we provide service in many different ways. Uh, and so you'll see a heavy dose of, of labor costs for that. Uh, staffing. Um, so there was a lot of staffing changes. Um, so position exchanges, and a lot of these happened uh, throughout the course of the year. They were positions that were traded. We'll trade you this position for that position. I actually really like to see department heads come to me with staffing changes, because that means they're reprioritizing what they have. Instead of just asking for something new or additional, they say, well, I'll give up this if I can have this. And maybe there's a slight cost difference for that, um, but it's better than just adding a brand new position. Um, and so I like to see the position changes that we have on here. When we talk about new positions added, there was 21.125 new positions added. Uh, a lot of those uh, within the sheriff's office, we had an investigator and eight primary service deputies. We also had a lot within health and human services, uh, particularly in uh, the children's services area, an area that we've been seeing a lot of increasing demand. And then we were able to eliminate uh, two and a half positions, uh, mostly in the ADRC, uh, where we've gone to contract services rather than preparing our own meals at the meal nutrition sites. And then in public health, uh, they eliminated a public health nurse position um, to cover um, an epidemiologist, which has been grant funded, uh, but that grant was expiring. And so they reprioritized what positions were important to them. Um, and they were able to retain the epidemiologist uh, by eliminating this position. So we ended up with a total of 18.633 new FTEs. Uh, so if you look at our authorized FTEs, that puts us just over 650 FTEs now uh, that were authorized. You see kind of a big jump now between 2024 20, uh, and 2023. We've been relatively flat really the last four years before that. Um, and so you can see sort of different jumps that the counties had. Um, but it's always an upward trend as we are growing county, more services, more people, uh, more staffing. Uh, for the employee benefits, um, we were able to maintain just a 1% increase in the health insurance, uh, which is much lower than the health insurance uh, market rate of 8 to 9%. We also are offering a um, dual choice this year. We're offering a high deductible in addition to our traditional PPO plan. Um, so the employees will have that option to choose. Um, so we're offering uh, some enhanced benefits uh, through choice for the employees. Uh, dental, we're up about 8% on the premiums. That is 75% employee funded, though. The county only picks up 25%. And then the WRS, those rates are set by the state. Uh, we don't have any control over that. Uh, so a tenth of a percent on general employees and a little over 1% on uh, the protected class employees. And so that does have an impact. I mean, that 1% increase in protected, uh, that's about $125,000 increase uh, in the county's expenses. We look at the mill rate, though. Um, so last year, I think we had talked about, uh, you know, that the mill rate, we had the potential to have the lowest uh, recorded mill rate as far back as I can trace it to the 1970s. There must not have been taxes before then because I couldn't find anything. Um, all right, so maybe there were taxes. Um, but back to 1975, I was able to find enough data uh, to calculate what the mill rate would have been for the county. Um, and you can see that uh, we've now reached the lowest mill rate uh, in that recorded history, so $2.83. Um, so you guys must be doing something right, uh, so keep up the good work. And as a comparison, you know, mill rate over our own history is great, but how do we compare to all our peers? Um, so we're the eighth lowest out of the 72 counties in the state. Um, so 
uh, we're doing really good compared to all of our peer counties. There's a few lower, but uh, uh, we're doing really well. We're 37% below the state average. And then if you look at it on a per capita basis, so how much do we tax per person that's in the county? Uh, so we're 24% below the state average. We're 19th lowest out of the 72 counties. So again, those are all really good uh, metrics that we can look at and compare ourselves to. Um, and our rate just continues to get lower. So what are the taxpayers going to see when they get their tax bill? Um, they're going to see, uh, well, it depends on where they live, um, but they're going to see overall that the county, um, on average, uh, is decreasing uh, the rate. Now, the real question, though, is where do they uh, live? Um, the highlighted ones, and they're, it's kind of small to see here, but the highlighted ones grew faster than the overall county rate. Um, so taxes are divided up. It's like a pie, a pumpkin pie specifically, uh, with Cool Whip. Um, but that pie is, is cut up uh, based upon each individual municipality's equalized value. So if your value increased in the city of Hudson, we're gonna give you a bigger piece of pie with extra Cool Whip um, next year. And if your value grew at a slower rate than the county average, you'll get a smaller piece of pie. Um, so in this case, you don't actually want the pie because it's taxes. But um, so communities, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I haven't had dinner yet, so I'm hungry. <laughs> but so, you know, the people that are highlighted, their communities grew faster than the average. So they're going to get their tax bill and they're going to see that the dollar amount that the county's getting is a larger dollar amount. Even if nothing else on their tax bill changes, they're going to see the county rate went up. It's because their community grew faster and they got a bigger piece. Um, and everyone that's uh, not highlighted is going to think you're doing a really good job because they're going to see that their county tax rate went down and they're paying less county taxes. So it's really hard to analyze um, individually whether um, the county did a good job or not because it depends on where you live in the county. Um, so everyone's perspective is going to be a little bit different. Um, so that's why we use those other metrics though where we talk about the mill rate of the county over the last 50 years. It's the lowest it's been in the last 50 years. We're doing everything we can to provide a reasonable uh, tax to the taxpayers for all the services that we're required to provide for them. And if you look at our peers, you know the eighth lowest in mill rate and the 19th lowest per capita. Uh, so we're doing a good job compared to all of our peer counties also. So no matter where you live, we're doing the best job that we can uh, to provide a good service at a reasonable rate. Um, so the last slide here is 2025, looking ahead uh, to what we have. Um, I think we will continue to see the county's tax levy rate decline. Um, I think it'll be lower yet uh, next year. Um, our net new construction, and while the economy has slowed a little bit, um, I don't think it's slowed all that much. I still think we'll see probably uh, at least three quarters of a million in net new construction value that's added. Uh, sales tax will probably be less than 500,000 because we were a little bit more aggressive this year, so we'll be a little bit less aggressive next year on the sales tax. With that though, um, I am not anticipating any new positions in 2025. I think we'll have just enough money to cover health insurance and a potential step increase. And then our debt service will continue to remain flat uh, with no increases there. So really overall, that's, that's where I see uh, 2025 looking. So are there any questions about the 2024 budget? I'm not gonna get into all the line item detail that we went over at the Committee of the Whole. Um, but uh, just know that it was a lot of work by the department heads and a lot of input from the elected officials, including the changes that you asked for at Committee of the Whole uh, that has the document that's in the packet tonight. Uh, Supervisor Otino. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, one question is the shared revenue part, if I remember correctly, that changed from the state and we had to give sales tax to the state then they divided it up and gave it back to the yeah. counties did we have a negative effect overall or a positive effect yeah so I don't know who does the math for the state but um, so sales tax in the state of Wisconsin the state collects 5% sales tax 
and they authorize counties to collect a half a percent. So we collect our half a percent, that's not changing, we're gonna get that half a percent. What the state said was, um, you know, we have so much extra money with this huge state surplus that what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one of those 5% that we collect and we're gonna give it back to the municipalities as additional shared revenue. So that's townships and villages and cities and counties and that's everyone. Um, but I calculated that uh, if we're collecting, you know, 12 million a year for half a percent, the state must be collecting 24 million for 1%. And our portion that came back was 753,000. Mm -hmm. So there's a small differenti differentiation in there uh, that might be rounding for the state. But um, yeah, it, it is, you know, if you add up all of the other uh, municipalities in St. Croix County, they're all getting additional also. It doesn't total 24 million. Sales tax is a wealth redistribution uh, process that they use in the state of Wisconsin. So to answer your question, we didn't give anything up, um, but we don't necessarily get the full value of St. Croix County taxpayers back into St. Croix County. Some of that money goes to other parts of the state. <clears throat> Thank you. One other quick question. Um, the township of Hudson recently reassessed everybody, and it, I know it goes, what, every three years. But that assessment shouldn't have any effect until the following year's taxes. So basically, um, I'm seeing that my property taxes should go down instead of going up as far as the county portion is concerned based on the numbers we're looking at. Is that a correct statement? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> yeah. So um, a municipality is reassessed. Um, they have to be within 10% of full value once every three years. So you can be between 90 and 110%. And as long as you stay in that range, you're fine. But once you veer below 90, or nobody ever goes over 110, but once you're below 90, uh, two years is fine. But that third year, you have to go do a reassessment. Okay, so that's the rule on when you get reassessed. So it can go years, but uh, minimum of, of three years usually in between. Now, the assessed value of a community is different than the equalized value of a community. So the equalized value is a um, number that the state makes up based upon their math. Uh, it's a formula of your assessed value divided by the sales price of equivalent properties. So you may be assessed at $300,000, but you wouldn't sell your house for $300,000. You're gonna sell your house for 500,000. Well, that ratio then is the difference between 500,000 and 300,000. That's how they calculate it. And so they go, well, your equalized value is probably closer to 500,000, not 300. So we divvy up the pie, our pie, the taxes, uh, to the municipalities based upon their equalized value because the equalized value is the same ratio uh, calculated evenly across all the municipalities in the county. The municipality then, so your town of Hudson will take their slice of pie and they're gonna redivide it and give you your piece of that slice based upon your assessed value. So when a reassessment happens, um, the equalized value does not change because it's a ratio between sales. So they can increase your assessed value and the ratio just becomes smaller. Your equalized value didn't change at all. So um, you didn't get any bigger of a piece of pie because of an, a reassessment. So a reassessment won't cause your taxes to go up or down from the county side. Now what will change is the same way that we look at it if your growth rate is higher or lower. So if you look at the average reassessed value in the community, so if everyone's properties went up on average of 20%, was your property higher or lower than the average? That'll tell you whether you're gonna get a bigger slice or a smaller slice. But just a reassessment doesn't cause it. It's really how you compare to the average is whether you see an increase or decrease. And I know that's clear as mud, but it's a very complex formula. <laughs> Actually, that's a great description in case we all get questions on that because I know uh, we will. Okay, any other questions? I'm going to turn to uh, the um, public comment portion of a public hearing. And this is an opportunity for anyone in the public to address the board regarding 
any questions or comments, uh, support, or whatever the case may be regarding the proposed 2024 budget. So is there anyone from the public who would like to address the board regarding the budget? Anyone from the public from regarding the 2024 budget? Okay, last chance, anyone from the public? Okay, seeing none, um, I will close the public hearing. And we'll move on to our business items. The first item is a resolution adopting the 2024 budget and establishing the tax levy. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve by Supervisor Cook. Do I have a second? Okay. Supervisor Burning. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I saw Supervisor Cook. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do still have a few concerns about us moving away from the historical approach that we've taken to sales tax and um, not moving them towards the KIP, but I also feel like this is a good budget. Um, it reflects a lot of work from staff, from our administrator, a lot of discussion here at the board and all our committees of the whole and all those various conversations, and I think it's a budget that reflects compromise. So. Um, I will support this budget. Supervisor Fiedler. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also, thank you. I also strongly support the budget, um, but I do have one amendment. It's been distributed to everybody. It's a relatively small dollar amount amendment. It's um, the utilization of some of the ARPA funds we've received. And it's a little complicated how we got to this point, but the bottom line was that uh, in a previous meeting, we hopefully took care of CASA, which I also strongly support for 2024, but that left us with some excess money that we didn't expend. And to make a long story short, this amendment then proposes how to expend that money, or most of it. We had 100,000 that was kind of left on the table, and we'll have far more that's left on the table as 2024 progresses, but we just don't know what it will be. So we'll see more ARPA money to come that's a topic of another discussion later next year. But relative to the amount we know we have available, um, I'm proposing that we am, uh, amend the budget to include $45,000 for the Salvation Army and $45,000 for Turning Point. Uh, these are, I, I selected these two items because they fulfill the purposes of ARPA. Uh, they um, actually, hopefully, are, are a, a complement what CASA does in some ways indirectly. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the great work that both of those organizations do with regard to housing families, uh, counseling people, and giving them personal care items, helping in domestic abuse relationships, and a number of other things I could go through. But this amendment simply uh, provides that $90,000 of that 100 be utilized for the Salvation Army and uh, Turning Point. Okay, I do need a second before we can discuss. Uh, Supervisor Telejohn. Um, comments? Uh, Supervisor Shirley. I just have a point of order question because our next business item is about ARPA funds. Is this, how does this work into our next business item or is this totally separate? The, the next business item was actually an amendment to the 2023 budget. Whereas my understanding is this is an amendment to our proposed 2024 budget. That's the distinction. Any discussion? Uh, Supervisor Cook. So I just have a question then. If we move forward with this amendment, will that be um, taking away from the funds that we are going to utilize for the next agenda item? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, other discussion? Uh, I think we're ready to vote on the amendment. And if I can clarify, the amendment to the budget is to allocate $90,000 of the uh, excess ARPA funds for the 2024 year to these two particular entities that are listed in the, in the uh, amendment that you have.
just uh, had a question on this. If we, with this, uh, with the two programs that you're doing this allocation for, um, can we justly pay out to those as uh, the, where they're performing a function that relates like a, a paid function from the county for services? What you'd be authorizing is for us to contract with these two organizations. I would still have to establish a contract with them. Okay, let's wrap up our voting. And that amendment appears to fail. So we're back to the original motion uh, on the floor regarding the uh, proposed 2024 budget. Any further discussion? It's your last chance. Okay, let's vote. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. And I'll also pass on my thanks and uh, gratitude toward the uh, county administrator and the staff for all the work and that they put into this. There's a lot that goes into it, as you've seen throughout the year. So uh, thank you. Okay, now we're back to, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the next item is number two, resolution amend for amendment number five to the 2023 budget for ARPA uses. Uh, do we have a uh, motion? Supervisor Cook, second. Supervisor Leaf. Supervisor Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to the, uh, all of the supervisors for supporting the funding that's going to CASA um, in the 2024 budget. As we've heard from the judges and from CASA advocates, from the executive director, uh, this program has a significant impact on our vulnerable children in St. Croix County. Um, we, this additional $100,000 that would be an amendment to the 2023 budget will help them along in their process of becoming independent, which we've all talked about on an ongoing basis. It gives them that footing to be able to uh, apply for additional grants and funds like that. And we, since we've committed the $200,000, I encourage my super fellow supervisors to support this additional amendment of $100,000 it follows the commitment that we're making, and it's, I feel like it's very important for um, the community. So I urge you to approve this additional $100,000. Thanks. Other comments, discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready to, oh, Supervisor Otino. I'd like to make a motion to uh, table this indefinitely. Motion to table indefinitely. Is there a second? Supervisor Barclow. Discussion. Well, I think we've discussed this um, at length in our last meeting, am I correct? And the $100,000 was put aside. It was turned down by the entire committee. And I don't see why we're doing it again. Comments? I have a question. Uh, Supervisor Burning? <clears throat> is that verified? Like, what is, <clears throat> what does our history show from that meeting? I mean, that, what uh, Supervisor Otino said is my recollection, but what, if I can call on the clerk or somebody to recall what we agreed upon in consensus, consensus with this body, because there was a lot of discussion around that, and now I'm sitting here thinking, 
did we or didn't we agree on that 100,000? So what, what does the record show on that? If you don't mind me asking, please. I can kind of speak on that. I wasn't at that meeting, but I believe pursuant to the rules governing the Board of Supervisors, the actions of the Committee of the Whole is to make recommendations or informal resolutions. What I understand is that it was referred back to Administration Committee to address 2023 budget. This was actually the last county board. It was a resolution. We struck the two lines and referred it back to committee. Committee. Okay. And Mr. Witt just corrected me that it was actually addressed at the last county board meeting which I can go through the minutes really quick and find the account. Yeah, if we can, that would be great because I don't want to sit here and vote on something and go, okay, we agreed on this, but we really didn't agree on what we're coming. You, you know what I mean? Like, I want to make sure that the record's right. And if we didn't come to consensus on it, there's no reason for me to vote for it. But if we did come to consensus on it because of the process that we went through, I will vote for the funding. So yeah. if you don't mind taking a moment to do that. That'd how, be great. Yeah, how I remembered it was um, we had struck the two lines out of the resolution um, and referred them back to committee. And so that's what had happened. Those two lines, they went back to committee, it was reconsidered, and they were sent back then to county board in the exact same format that they had been struck last month. Uh, Supervisor Otino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we did discuss this at length in the last meeting. And um, that's why I wanted to uh, bring that motion to table because I don't want to tie up. We tied up a lot of time um, and came to the decision. So now the administration committee came back to us with the exact same paperwork we just went through and turned down. So I, I don't understand why. I, if we table it, they can come back later with another proposal. That would be my opinion. Thank you. Supervisor Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe, as the chair of the administration committee, the direction was to send it back to administration committee to have a conversation about. There wasn't necessarily a decision here. The decision was to send it back to administration committee for us to discuss again, which we did. We voted to send it back with this recommendation to the board. Supervisor Shirley. <clears throat> well, we're still waiting for uh, Corp Council to come back. My, my concern still with this is that we're tying any remaining ARPA funds as these projects come in under budget and we have more ARPA funds, we're just pushing them to the government center um, as any remaining funds. And I think, I know we have until 2024 to spend these, these, uh, these funds down, but to tie us into that right now, I think is a mistake. Give us one second here. So I apologize for the delay. Uh, we were just reading over the minutes from the last county board meeting, and that was when um, Supervisor Burning made the motion to reconsider to address everything except for the CASA and the HVAC, and that was to uh, be discussed at the Committee of the Whole. Then at Committee of the Whole, that was a separate item discussed, um, and what I believe happened at Committee of the Whole is that the uh, CASA and anything for amendments for 2023 budget were sent back to the administration committee to discuss further. At administration committee, the new resolution for amendment number five was approved, I believe three to two for the CASA and the HVAC funding. So that's what I have historically reviewed. So the motion on the floor is to um, uh, <laughs> table, I'm sorry, couldn't hear it. Table indefinitely, uh, which only requires a majority vote, I believe, whereas a budget amendment uh, would require uh, two thirds. Just to keep that in mind. Supervisor Ramberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I was reading, um, I was reading the uh, resolution as 
as was sent out and how I read the excess that we're asking about that's, that's a, a pond being pondered or doesn't, is unknown is um, my comfort came with the government center expansion project has over $1 million in HVAC related expenses that qualify. There haven't been allocated, but that can be allocated to is how I read it. So there's going to be uh, $1 million worth of uh, expenses that it can be assigned to, and there's no way that there's going to be that amount of an excess is how I read it. Am I correct? That is correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Supervisor Shirley. <clears throat> so my concern still is with the government center pushing any remaining funds there, but if we're going to go down that road, then we have approval for $80 million for the government center expansion. So if any additional funds from there go there, then that I'm assuming is going to get reduced from the $80 million that's approved, correct? No. <laughs> so the $80 million was borrowed for uh, the government center project. Um, and so that will all be used towards that. Um, so at the end of the day, any monies that's left over from that project can be used on other capital improvement projects. And so we'll allocate those to a capital improvement project so we've spent the 80 million that's borrowed and we spent any ARPA dollars borrowed and then I will use any cash fund balance out of the KIP for projects. So really from an accounting standpoint, that would be the priority order though. Yeah, I, I get that, but, but we're not authorizing additional ARPA dollars to go towards the, the government spend, to spend an additional whatever this amount comes over. So we're, um, so the government center won't be over the $80 million is what I'm, what I'm getting to. I know that that fund uh. is already, we've already done, borrowed the money and the money has to be spent somewhere, yeah. but we've also, also only allocated 80 million for the expansion. Yeah. So I would spend the 80 million we borrowed. I'd spend the two and a half million dollars in interest earnings that we're going to have on it. And then I would spend, uh, any ARPA dollars that end up getting allocated towards it. So I would look at it, I would interpret it as I'm authorized to spend those dollars on the project, which basically just flexes that contingency fund amount that I have available. Just being honest how I interpret it. Other comments? Uh, Supervisor Burning? So we were three to two in admin. It was very close in the regular committee of the whole. We're going right back to $300,000 for a year and a half. Again, it doesn't matter if it's ARPA dollars, county levy. I mean, it sounds like this is going to be, we're going to kickstart it and then we're going to fundraise for it. And then we can't fundraise for it. So we need, we need some more money. I get it. I'm not dogging the program. So don't take my words wrong on this, but I'm just sitting here looking at this going, when, when are we going to stop with this? How are we putting any, there's no restrictions in the resolution. There's no, um, there's nothing there to say, bring us back detailed report on what you're using for the, with, with that money. Um, and what happens in 2025 when it's not funded and we got all these kids that need it, then what? You know, I mean, real, realistically, is it not established enough at that point? How about 2026? How about 2027, 30, 25? I mean, I, this is a bad precedent to set. It's, it's, um, I don't know. I, I, I <laughs> there are so many kids that need our help and there are so many people that need our help. There's no doubt that this program is going to help all around. I think if we do this, we need to put we need to put some sort of contingencies on there that it is shown what is being done with this money specifically, and it can't Supervisor, just be. Supervisor Burning, can I address your question real quick? I think so, as long okay. as the chair allows it. Chair, um, this was raised at the committee of the whole, and I can't remember if it was yourself or Supervisor Atino that raised it. 
and I committed at that time that PPJ that has oversight over costs that would in fact conduct exactly what you just asked for. But it's not in the resolution. No, no, no. And so just to continue, so what we did at our last meeting, we asked Mr. Kinsella to come before us and he gave a nice presentation on where they were, where they were going, and we've worked out that periodically, every quarter, he will make a major presentation to the PPJ on precisely the standards you just raised. So it's not in the resolution, but we've already started doing the oversight of CASA, and we've got a program worked out with Mr. Kinsella to continue it every quarter. So it will be addressed. So with that being said, and thank you for reminding me of that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. So that's great. I would like it in the resolution. Is there a way to amend this to make that happen? Because then it is, therefore it is written, not just somebody said. Because we all know how that happens. And it's, again, it's not anything to do with the person. It has everything to do with the position and the policymakers going forward. And I think we need to have that, something in writing that, that um, puts that as a, as, a, as a target, as a we need to have it for it is written. That, that's why we have these. So I guess that is, since, it, since this is my second and final turn to, term, turn to speak on this issue, uh, I don't know how to state this motion, so I'm going to ask Corp Council to help me. I would like language in there. Well, that just hey, I, I'm sorry, I want to interrupt because the motion on the floor right now is to table. So we you're can't, right. We cannot. Thank you. Um, change the resolution as it stands. Okay. So with my final statement on this particular motion, I am not going to support the table or the motion to table because I would like to am amend it to have verbiage in there. Okay. Any other quick comments? I think we're ready to vote on the motion to table the resolution indefinitely. Okay, that fails. Uh, so we're back to the original resolution. Um, so, Supervisor Burning, would you like to uh, <laughs> make a motion to amend? Yes. Uh, I don't know, Heather, help me <laughs> with this, because I'd like to put something in there that requires this. Why and I, I would like to also... Through the admin committee. <laughs> that should have been done at the admin committee. Totally. So I'd like to have something in there that requires this, uh, what we talked to, uh, what Supervisor, uh, or Chairman, Vice Chairman Fiedler talked to. I'd like something like that in the resolution as an amendment. Are you asking for uh, quarterly reporting to the Public Protection Judiciary Committee? I mean, is that? Whatever it was that was discussed, I would like that in the resolution. That's what we discussed, and I would certainly have no problem with it. I'm looking at some of the members of the committee, and we, that's exactly what we discussed, so we have no problem with it. Do you want me to try to work Yeah, can you interpret my babbling into something that's coherent for this body to vote on? So this is how I would. <laughs> the, this is how I would interpret your motion. Um, I would add lines 28 and 29 to indicate, uh, now therefore be it further resolved, that the that CASA shall report quarterly to the Public Protection and Judiciary Com Committee regarding um, progress in fundraising and any other items that are relevant. That's acceptable. That's my motion. Oh, I gotta remember what I said. I need a second, Supervisor Leaf. Okay, now we get to discuss the resolution as amended. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. My mistake. Okay, discussion on the amend amendment to the resolution. Anyone have any comments or suggestions? Supervisor Otino. Yes, I wanna make sure I understand this totally clearly. So with this amendment, we're 
going to approve then what we turned down in the last meeting as far as the dollars amount are concerned in the additional of the addition of hundred thousand dollars is that a correct yeah. well, what so the, the amendment I mean, it says right here they're looking for the hundred thousand yeah. dollars <throat> of additional funding that we didn't we disallowed at our last meeting we only allowed the 200 if the amendment is successful, your next vote then would be on the amended resolution, which would be giving $100,000 to CASA in 2023. The amendment is adding the reporting requirement. I'm going to suggest we're ready to vote. And this is the voting on the amendment to the resolution. And that passes. Say so now on the floor is the original resolution as amended, adding the quarterly reporting requirements. Any discussion, any further discussion? Supervisor Shirley. I still really feel that we need to pull out the, the government center uh, portion of this resolution. I think we have additional uh, conversations that we need to have about what is actually um, the 80 million was approved and to add that on top of interest income we've had that discussion a little bit already i know but we were approved at 80 million now we're just tacking on something else and something else and something else i think we need to get a control on that and get um, casa approved and through and talk about this later can I just clarify, Supervisor Shirley, are you making a motion to remove the HVAC components of this resolution, which would be lines 17 through 19 and 26? I will. And we need a second. I'll second that. Second by per, uh, Supervisor Burning. Now we're ready to discuss. Ready to discuss the uh, proposed amendment um, eliminating the uh, the HVAC component of the resolution. Could, uh, yeah, I'd if ask I could maybe just uh, Supervisor or uh, uh, County Administrator Witt to um, yeah. uh, discuss the impact. Yeah, just to, to clarify a little bit further what I was saying before to Supervisor Shirley. So does it increase the amount uh, that we can spend on the government center project? Yes, it does, by whatever that amount might be. Is it 10,000, is it 100,000? I don't know exactly how much will be left over at the end, but it's a way to wrap up all the federal dollars. So yes, it would provide additional money. It goes into the contingency fund of the project then, and when we get to the end of the project, we're gonna look at where we are with the contingency fund and go, okay, well, these are the parts of the project that we'd cut out at the beginning to make sure we're under budget, we're gonna add those back in. Is it the solar panels so we have energy savings in the future? Is it the roadway out to Vine Street? Um, the subcommittee will talk about the money that we have, which project is gonna be the priority, and how we'll spend the rest of the contingency to wrap up the project at the end. This would add to that money that's available for that. Other questions, comments on the proposed amendment? Supervisor Cook? It seems to me that we have a process in place to make sure we're already spending this contingency fund appropriately, so I would suggest we keep the HVAC components in this amendment, in this resolution, excuse me. The, Supervisor Burning? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if we are if we need these dollars down the road for something else, are we able to move them out of the contingency fund and back over? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there wouldn't be any reason you couldn't. Okay. Okay, any other uh, final questions, comments? So we're now voting on the um, motion to amend the resolution eliminating the, uh, is it line 26? 
17 through 19 and 26. 17 through 19 and 26. So that's what we're voting on to eliminate those. And that motion fails. So now we're back to the original um, uh, resolution as amended, adding the quarterly reporting requirement. Are there any final comments? Uh, Supervisor Rotino. Yes, this started out as a $50,000, uh, in a sense, donation to a 501c3, which I thought at the time was not allowed based on the county's rules. I still think it's opening up a very sticky situation because now if I have a 501c3, why can't I come to the county and ask for $50,000? I know that uh, Coco's Heart just saved 400 dogs off the North Dakota reservation over this last weekend, and a lot more of them are up there still going to freeze to death. And I just don't understand why we're going down this road. Because if we do, I'm going to be the first one in line to ask for $50,000 for another 501c3. And I, there'll be another dozen of them right behind them asking for the same, same consideration. And how are you going to say no? But I think this was wrong in the first place. It passed, and I understand that. But um, I am totally against this. Thank you. Other comments? Let's go ahead and vote on the resolution as amended, adding the um, reporting requirements. Twelve? Yeah, Thirteen to five, so it's approved. Or 13 to 5. Okay, so that passes the two thirds requirements, so that resolution is adopted. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to number three ordinance amending chapter uh, regarding road setback reduction within land division chapter of St. Croix County Code of Ordinances. Uh, do we have a motion? Supervisor Shirley, second. Supervisor Van Summeren, uh, who would like to discuss this as uh, Chair Hansen is not with. I can talk about this. Um, community development, we've had this uh, come up over and over and over again about uh, road setback reductions. Um, a long time ago, they were 100 feet. Uh, they've gotten reduced to, to 50 feet uh, quite a few years ago. We are still seeing those come in monthly. So instead of having, um, having that, this will set it up so that they can administratively do that in-house uh, with staff and we don't have to continue to have um, um, committee time uh, taking care of this and public hearings. Uh, Supervisor Counter, sorry. Hard to see me back here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to add on a couple of things that part of the, you know, with this, part of the deal is why they have to do this is because they they have to also uh, change the maps. Because um, on the current, when these, when the setbacks were at 100 feet originally, um, the policy of the time in the ordinance was that they had to uh, place that setback on the maps so um, part of the part of the deal with why these hearings have to take place is that they have to make an order that they do a um, I forget what they call it a, a what was that uh, it's, certified survey well there's a corrective instrument thank you corrective instrument was the words I was trying to think of um, so they have to do a corrective instrument to get that changed and and get the maps corrected so that that isn't there anymore so that people in the future, when they look at those lots, they aren't confused with it. 
So by doing this, it helps cut the timeliness of somebody that's applying for this because it's, it is a process. And if they have to wait for our community development meeting and it, that sets them back timelines and everything. So we're trying to streamline it, make this more in-house so that they can get through the process yet do it legally. Other questions, uh, discussion? All right, seeing none, we're ready to vote. Thank you, and that motion passes unanimously. And the last business item on our uh, for this evening, ordinance amending chapter 77 annual county vehicle registration fee. Do we have a motion? Supervisor Rotino, and do we have a second? Supervisor Adams. Um, Supervisor Rotino, would you like to take this one? Please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think you all know my historical opinion of this uh, um, issue, but we've come to a point where um, if we don't, our services are gonna slow, basically. And the only other way of uh, keeping up with it would probably be to have a moratorium on new building. And I don't think we wanna even try to go down that road. But I would like uh, to ask uh, Robbie to come up and give the little presentation, it's just a small part of the presentation to explain how that money works and how we're still the lowest of, of the states that surround us for vehicle registration. Thank you, and thanks, Robbie. Do you want me to show them the cost to drive slide, Rick? Is that what you really, can. sure. Yeah. Can I get to the internet quick? Oh, okay. And then you'll have an, actually an example of a vehicle we can have one of our supervisors see how much it's going to cost them for their next vehicle tabs so we we try to show this slide i think it's a great slide the wisconsin department of transportation puts this together to compare to our neighbors and it's something we illustrated at the committee level and um, this is a great example of what it costs to drive both in wisconsin and surrounding states so it's a combination of your vehicle registration fee from the state, your locals, and as well as your fuel tax. So it's all based on fuel economy and all that. A great example, let's say um, you went out and bought a new Ford one F-150. Um, I'm in crossover, so that's, let me get to trucks. Um, and you can run this for almost any vehicle. There's a, there's a few that aren't, but, um, but it's surprisingly accurate because it's based on your average fuel economy so say a 22 Ford F-150, and you're going to drive 15,000 miles a year, and you live in St. Croix. That's your cost to drive in comparison to the other states. So that's your, and really the bulk of that is your value-based registration fees. So other states have a value base, where Wisconsin does not, as a flat, flat user fee as well as a relatively low fuel tax. So what you see there is the, the discrepancy. It also factors in that cost within St. Croix as far as the local vehicle registration fee. What that registration fee does for St. Croix is it goes directly into our construction budget. Um, it allows us to try to keep up with inflation and, and try to pave the amount of roads. What I can also tell you is it's going to go into a lot of intersection enhancements in the next decade. Some of our intersections, um, New Richmond, Somerset, Hudson are starting to feel the pressure of growth and we're starting to see accident rates tick up. So we're gonna to try to solve some of those accidents before they happen. And if you look in here, there's no Ford Bronco. So Rick thinks that uh, he is, he is I, I wanted to point out for Christine and I that um, under this formula from the state, we don't pay anything for vehicle registration <laughs> for a Ford Bronco. So Rick really likes this uh, website. 
Anybody have any questions for, oh yes, uh, Supervisor Ramberg. So can I have your autograph? Is that what this is, is an autograph? Okay, thank you. Uh, as far as... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, does anyone have any uh, any legitimate questions um, or comments uh, regarding the, uh, the motion on the floor, Supervisor Burning? I I just want to say that I am supporting this mostly because of the consensus that we came to on this budget. Um, I am very much against this but because we were able to fund more law enforcement, we were able to come to that conclusion. I think that's a great trade-off for three and a half million dollar levy override for a $5 registration. So I'm okay supporting this because we're not spending days and days and weeks and weeks fighting over this and we got law enforcement some backup. So that's why I'm gonna support this. Other comments, questions? Like seeing uh, Supervisor Anderson. I um, want. I mean, I I know. I guess the answer is pretty obvious. But how how much of an impact would it be? I I'm considering proposing an amendment to 15 on this, so dropping it five dollars, um, doubling it in one year. When I understand it hasn't been adjusted for a while, but 50 percent seems like a pretty good increase. Um, so not considered. Um, yeah. So I want to. I, I guess I want to. I want to propose an amendment to a, a fifteen dollar instead of twenty dollar. And do we have a second, Supervisor Shirley? Okay. Discussion on uh, amending this from twenty to fifteen. Supervisor Otino. During our discussion when this was first brought up, the um, dollar amount that we all, everybody seemed to be in favor of was, this, is, this has not been altered. It, it was to go from the $10 registration fee to the $20 registration fee at max. And during our discussion, our job was to determine what we felt was the need during our committee um, for the amount of money that we need to maintain our roads, to uh, ensure safety, um, snow plowing, and, and that and in our consensus, that's what our uh, committee came up with, and that's what we presented to you. It is from 10 to 20. It hasn't been increased. Robbie, what was it, 20? It's been forever. So since its inception, it's been in 2008, and there's a supervisor sitting in the far corner that was in my position when I was formed. So in 2008, it was put at a 10. To give you a statewide perspective, about just under 20% of the counties have vehicle registration fees. Um, we're the only one at 10. Uh, there is one county at 15, which is Langlade, and then the rest are $20 and above. Just to give you a perspective statewide. Supervisor Van Summer. I think another thing we have to keep in mind is, <clears throat> if you remember the latest survey that we all had copies of and, and looked at, uh, transportation, the, the, the condition of the roads was a very high priority by most people who answered that survey. Uh, $5 would add some, but $5, you can't even drive through McDonald's and buy a single hamburger for $5. It's a very small pittance. Uh, I, I think let's, instead of doing this this year five and next year five, let's just do 10 and, and have it over with. I think that makes the most sense. Uh, if you all remember last, uh, Robbie complaining about how much it cost to plow the snow last year and, and the snow season has just begun, I don't want to put up with that again. Let's, let's just make it 10 to start. <laughs> Other uh, comments on the amendment? Supervisor Ramberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, and I feel felt found. I, I felt the same way when we first brought this up because I did all the surveying uh, with the citizens that I knew of in the nursing homes and everything to see. Ten dollars came out screaming at that meeting, and we pondered it to 20 back in 20. We researched it from 20, uh, 2006 and 7, and then brought the results of the research back, 
and uh, I threw $10 on there because that's what I was hearing. We wanted, or several members wanted 20, and uh, it was the administration committee that assigned me to look for an alternative revenue source. And I look, we do not have a football team, so we don't have that kind of time. We don't have a hotel motel, so we can't do Went through all of them. This was the only one that came to the surface. And then we brought it forward, and it moved forward. And Minnesota at the time had one, so it was probably uh, uh, folks that were coming in were that I was talking to were used to it. But uh, then I felt the same way. I thought, well, what if we go five? I'm aging myself. That was 2007. And I think inflation is more than the 10. So I'm more comfortable with the 10 than I was earlier as well. So just to speak to that, I just want to let you know I felt the same way, and I'm the originator of it. So thank you. Comments? Were you pointing or do you raising your hand? <laughs> Supervisor Burning. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for some reason, I remember $5 being floated out there as an alternative as well. We may not have came to consensus on it, but I, I, I think I seriously misread this because I thought, I seriously thought $5 is what we were proposing. I thought $5 is what we had talked about. Maybe it was just in my dreams. Um, but then again, you know, that'd be weird if I dreamed about $5 vehicle registration increases. So I, I'll support the five. I think, I think it's important for us also to, to, um, let people know that we don't want to hit them with fees when they're going, our taxpayers are going through inflation too. So everyone's going through inflation. I think we ease this because it is needed. Safety's needed, roads being plowed are needed, but $5 I can, I'll support that. And I thought that's what I was supporting originally. So shame on me for not um, fine tooth combing that. So I'll support the $5 amendment. Any other comments? Okay, we're ready to vote on the motion to amend the resolution from uh, a $10 increase to 20, but a $5 increase to 15. Okay, it appears that that motion fails, so now we're back to the original motion, the original resolution for a $20 increase. I'm sorry, not a $20 Excuse increase. Me. Increase. $20, a $10 in, increase. Increase to 20. To 20, 10. correct. Any other comments? Let's go ahead and vote on this. And that motion is approved. So the uh, this this would be for 2024, uh, correct? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chair, that doesn't start till January 1st, and if, like in my case, I think my license plate is October, so I won't even <laughs> see that till October on one, and the other one is earlier in the year. But I, I, I can pay it early if I'd like. So. And I just, I just want to thank the Transportation Committee for hashing that through as well, because I know it was a difficult issue. Okay, we're going to move on from our business items to uh, our annual reports. We just have one tonight for our uh, District Attorney, Carl Anderson. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try to keep it relatively short. Um, sure you all saw it in the packet I'll just kind of highlight some points um, so again we applied and uh, we're approved for the TAD grant we're doing the application for next year which is due in a couple weeks currently um, that's spearheaded by Lisa Maltoff our head of diversion she works with Phil Dolly too from uh, Justice Support Services on that um, we've done a lot of collaboration with JSC on, you know, that's kind of an ever evolving thing on supervision of defendants on bond, um, supervision of diversion defendants, um, 
we, if you see in the budget, we're down quite a bit what you'd expect from or the projected revenue. That's just because we're reimbursed by DO, by the state for victim witness services. And we've only been reimbursed for the first six months of the year. We don't get reimbursed for the second half, second six months until uh, the end of the year. And that also, we're, it's expected we're going to get an extra 20 grand uh, that they're increasing that reimbursement rate for uh, 2024, which is good. Uh, the report has some numbers. We've had uh, 1,800 adult defendants, 675 felonies, 587 misdemeanors. I think I've spoken about that kind of trend at previous meetings where we're having more felonies, uh, less misdemeanors. Partly that's as the county grows, we have to prioritize. Sheriff's Department prioritizes, we prioritize, and we prioritize the felonies. Um, we've had 91 participants that successfully completed diversion program. 22 were revoked. Uh, I spoke with this group last year. I mean, um, well, I'm trying to remember. I think it was beginning of this year where you all supported a resolution asking the legislature to increase pay for ADAs. I don't know if a lot of you might have heard what happened, but that happened. Um, and it's huge for every DA's office in the state. The starting salary for ADAs went from 50000 to mid-70s. So um, we're not going to have the massive turnover that we've been having. And we have had stability now. We're fully staffed. And that's a game changer for us. Um, Big stressor we've had that I'm sure you're also all aware of is the number of homicides we've had in the county. Um, no really rhyme or reason to them. They're just, there's no commonality really. That's, I'm sure if you talk to other people, other parts of the state, they all comment on it. Whenever I talk to prosecutors from the other rest of the state, they all comment on it. We're working through them. The expect to see will be over on our expert witness fees and budgets for this year and next year just because with those major cases we have to pay big bucks for doctors and forensic pathologists and it's just uh, cost of doing business and we have when you have all those big cases that um, can't really plan can't really we try to we did actually I'll get to this in a little bit but in our budget we did increase it I think it was 3,000 which is crazy low I think we increased it to 12 um, Overall, our budget decreased, but um, just to be a little bit more realistic on what we pay, I think our last homicide case, we had one single expert where the bill was $19,000, so they add up. Uh, you can see on packet page 178, there's some graphs on our numbers. Um, oh, I, I guess I'll let me back up on 406. So... We do have a request for diversion, legal assistant. We haven't had a new legal assistant by next year for two decades, position added. Diversion, it's been a decade, and that was a part-time position when that was added. So that was a request last year, too. Uh, the need continues to be there. I understand we're prioritizing uh, Sheriff's Department, which I think you know that's kind of the front end. Um, my hope is that when the money's there, we can kind of assist my office, clerk of courts, with uh, the increasing caseload, with the increasing population. <clears throat> um, one huge thing that helps us a lot is moving the CHIPS cases, so the child protection cases, to Corp Council, because that is, as it, let me, let me give you the actual number here, uh, 218 cases. So that's a substantial caseload for a prosecutor, and it's a full caseload for a legal assistant, and those are now out of our office. So that helps a lot. Um, it allows our office manager to try to work on one of our goals, which is transitioning to electronic discovery instead of printing and mailing. You just hit click and send it off. There's a secured system to do that, so um, she's working on that now. Um, the cases, you can, as I mentioned before, number of felonies is going up, has been for the past few years. That reflects the number of witnesses we deal with um, or work with is going up. The budget changes, as I mentioned, okay, here's the actual numbers. Uh, it was 2,000, which, again, was insanely low. 
now we're we're putting 15,000 as what we ex hope it to be. It, we don't have major cases in a year. Very well might be a lot less. You know, if we have another year or two like we've had, that's going to be higher. But we're trying to hit the middle of the, the road. Uh, we're, we don't have the thirty-five thousand for the child protection uh, cases. We, you guys, helped us out or can with a stopgap while we were struggling uh, with caseload. Um, but now that th those cases are in corp council, um, that money, we don't need that money. The I think that's about it as I the high points if anyone has any questions happy to answer them but any questions supervisor burning can you hear me okay so um, with your with your cases that you have the the pending homicides mm -hmm. have you do you feel like you've asked for enough money to cover the bills that are coming up in 2024 or do you see foresee possibly having to amend the budget to get you more money um, it's definitely going to be over 15,000. The, and I guess it was, it was part of, I had a discussion with Ken about it, you know, do we, cause this is the worst year we probably had in decades totally. for major cases in the county. Do we budget for that or, you know, or do we try to hit what we ex hope it will be year after year and modify it? And I kind of chose the latter. So, um, my hope is generally we're under budget and we can take the money from something else. I think even with our big bill this year, we'll, I think we'll be hopefully under budget overall, um, partly because the, some of that money we had for a CHIPS prosecutor we didn't end up using. So um, that's how, it, frankly, it's kind of picking a number out of a hat because you just never know what you're going to get for a caseload. I think my first five years here, we had one homicide. You know, now we have six pending currently, so. So then um, a follow-up on the felonies that you guys are seeing an increase in. Where, what area do you see the biggest increases in? And then uh, further after that, so how, how do you see that impacting your staff, considering, you know, you're getting a lot of, um, like we're stabilizing it, but you still have probably a younger staff than, than most law offices. So. How does that impact you and being able to bring justice and, and, and do it in a, an effective manner? So um, I haven't looked at the actual numbers for a while on the types of crimes. Anecdotally, I'd say it's just kind of across the board that there's no one type of crime that really stands out. I know nationwide retail thefts is exploding, for example. We haven't really seen that here. It's just kind of, I think generally as the population grows, we're just seeing an increase across the board in the types of crimes. I mean, we're seeing more fentanyl cases. Um, that is also kind of, that's a national trend too. Um, as far as the effect on the office, I mean, the reality is we have the number of bodies we have, so there's only so much time in the day, so when we get a higher caseload, you have less time to devote to each case. Um, as far we're lucky with our legal assistants, they've you know our legal assistants have pretty much say for uh, we had a couple turnover, but other than that, everyone's been there like 14 plus years. Um, so the good news is with that turnover we did have with the no increase in salaries for ADAs for a long time, um, the legal assistants who have been there you know decades have been great at kind of you know hey make sure you get this done, and then luckily we do have. Um, now four prosecutors with quite a bit. We have four prosecutors that are maybe a year or two in, and then we have four that are seven to 20 years. So um, we've, we've been prioritizing the more serious cases with the more serious seasoned prosecutors. And then um, while still trying to give the newer attorneys a varied caseload, so hopefully to keep it interesting for them rather than just giving them all OWI ones and twos and retail thefts. Other questions? All right, hang in there, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right, uh, are there any requests for future agenda items? Uh, seeing none, any uh, county clerk's report or correspondence?
I do not have any um, correspondence or rezonings, but I did want to let everybody know that the candidacy paperwork um, for 2024 spring election is in the county clerk's office if you want to pick up a packet for that. Just a couple of important dates to remember with that is you can't circulate, circulate nomination papers until December 1st, and then everything is due back in the county clerk's office by 5 p.m. on January 2nd. Also, um, we should have that stuff up on our website too if you'd rather electronically fill out um, some of those and bring them in that way. They should be on the website within the week. And then I do also have non-candidacy paperwork should anybody choose not to run, and that is due back to the county clerk's office by December 22nd. That's it. Thank you. Any uh, other items? Um, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, just with the, uh, the budget books, if you want to return your budget book, uh, we will recycle the guts out of it. I will print new budget books with the uh, final column adopted by the county board filled in. Supervisor Fiedler. And just a quick announcement. Uh, the Wisconsin Counties Association has something called the County Ambassadors Program, and all of us can be ambassadors, and what the goal of the program is to get the supervisors two or three times a year to get down to Madison to chat with our assembly members and state senators. In mid-October, Supervisor Osnes and I and Kristen Newton, who heads up the ADRC, went down as part of the ambassador program. We met with all of our state senators and representatives from this area, had great receptions from all of them, and several of them, after we talked to them about uh, different things dealing with driver safety, payments to uh, kin as opposed to foster pay parent payments, and also dealing with expert fees. Carl mentioned that, something that would cut the cost of expert fees. Several of them uh, uh, joined uh, bills that did exactly that. So I think it was a very successful visit. And thanks to uh, Supervisor Osnes and um, Kristen Newton. Thank you. Any other um, announcements? All right, seeing none, it's 631. We are adjourned. Thank you.